Welcome everyone. Thank you for connecting today. And today's Ollie Brown Bag will start promptly now. So it's great to have you all here. My name is Sorel Oberlander and I am the Library Dean and serving as the Interim Dean for the College of Extended Education and Global Engagement. And I wanna thank you for being here and our speaker, Dr. Kutcha Reisling Baldi. Thanks to the friends of Ollie and volunteers that make this possible. At the end of the presentation, please ask your questions by raising your hand or um, asking in the chat. I will now turn it over to Jane Woodward, OLLI Curriculum Committee member to read our speaker's bio and in introduce our speaker today. Thank you, Jane. Well, thank you. And it's very nice to get an opportunity to see you even if it's only online and via Zoom, uh, since you are now in a position of substantial significance in our world. And I'm very happy to introduce uh, Dr. Kucha Rizling Baldi, who is Hupa Yurok and Kar Karuk. Is am I pronouncing that right? She's now an associate professor um, and department chair of the Native American Studies at Humboldt State University. Her research is focused on indigenous feminisms, California Indians, and decolonization. She is the author of We Are Dancing for You. Native Feminisms and the Revitalization of Women's Coming of Age Ceremonies, dated 2018. She co-founded the Native Women's Collective, a nonprofit organization that supports the continued revitalization of Native American arts and culture. And Kucha, it's all yours. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Jane. Um, Jane is the one who invited me actually to submit to do a talk uh, as part of the Institute. So I'm very happy that um, it has finally come into being. Uh, I think it's really important to be able to engage in multiple ways with people. And um, when I had to think of a topic of what I wanted to talk about, I was in the midst of actually uh, teaching some of my students about one of the cases that we're gonna talk about today. And I asked them, I said, well, what should I talk about? And they were like, you should talk about this case because it's a Supreme Court case that came from Humboldt County and it had to do with Humboldt County tribes. And I don't think a lot of people know that we've been so involved at these very high levels of what was going on with like the law and the land and the protection of sacred sites. And so I said, okay, I'll do that one. So you're getting this lecture today because a bunch of students in my class were like, do that. Uh, and that's the reason why. Um, I am Dr. Ketcher Risling Baldi. I am the department chair of Native American studies at Humboldt State. I'm, out, I'm also Hoopa Yurking Karuk, enrolled in the Hoopa Valley Tribe. Um, I grew up in this area. I graduated from Arcata High School. Uh, and then after Arcata High School, went to Stanford University. Uh, and then after that, went to San Diego State for my master's degree. And then after that, went to Davis for my PhD. Uh, but with the goal of always coming home and I wanted to do work from home and I wanted to be able to work with people at home. So, when the job opened up at Humboldt State, I applied for it, uh, even though I had been at San Diego State as a professor in American Indian Studies. And I think returning home has been a really important experience for me, uh, being able to work in the space with peoples who, I think some of the work that indigenous peoples are doing in this region is, is leading work for the, the nation, if not internationally in the world. We're doing things that people are talking about internationally. Um, and when we, when we participated in the return of Tuluat to the Wiat people uh, in 2019, that became an international story. I was interviewed by people from Australia and New Zealand and Scandinavia and all over the place about what is going on in Humboldt County that you all returned a sacred island to the Wiat peoples. I think that people are talking about Humboldt County as a place of great vision and, and, and a, a place of possibility. And I think that that's something that we should remember when we think about the work that we're doing with indigenous peoples. Um, when I talk to people about Tuluat, I always say that when I was growing up, a lot of people referred to it as Indian Island. That's how they would say this is, that's Indian Island. And, uh, and they'd only became called that because of a massacre that happened there. And so my, in, when we were growing up, uh, they would say, it's not Indian Island, it's Tuluat. It's a place of world renewal. And we have to remember its name and we have to know it as a place of great significance. Um, and I remember being young and uh, Cheryl Seidner, who was the chairwoman and now spiritual leader of the Wiat peoples, 
uh, she just started talking to people about how she was going to get Tuluat back. And she was like, yeah, we're going to get that island back. The, we'll get that island back someday. And I remember people telling her and saying to her, like, that's impossible. Like, that will never happen. And that, that'll never be something that can come in, like, come to be. And she would be like, no, 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 where it's going to happen. Uh, in Indigenous places, what we say is nothing can become until you speak it into being. Uh, nothing can be until you tell a story about it, because that's the only way it can kind of start to become again. So in her saying, we're going to get it back, she spoke into being that one day they would get it back. And people told her that's impossible. Uh, and then I was like, now fast forward 25 years later, and I was in the room when they gave it back. I gave a talk actually that day when they gave it back. And um, I was really struck by the fact that I could now say that uh, I had seen something impossible happen in my lifetime. And so I always say to people, that's what I think the role of Native American studies is for people. We, uh, we dream things into being and we make the impossible possible. And that nothing, and that they only tell you something's impossible because they are afraid of what that could be. But we keep pushing and uh, then we see impossible things become possible. And that's the importance of the work that we do. Um, and so I, I just say that to start because I think everything that I do, like talk wise, sometimes when I talk, people go, oh, that was a lot. Like it was like, she's got like real big ideas about what we should do about it or like what should happen. And I don't know, that's kind of scary. And I always say, yeah, my job is to speak into being what could be. And then uh, it sits with you. And then little things start happening to make those things become possible because we are the first of the storytellers, um, those of us that teach the young people. We help the young people to tell the stories that they, they envision. And the reason why I like working with our young people so much, I always say this to people, I, I love working with young people. And the reason why is that uh, they, are, they are at the point where they like to dream things and they don't have the same thing that I do. So they'll come to me and they'll be like, I really wanna do, and they'll say it, or I really think this should happen in our community, or I really think this should be the way that we do things. And in my mind, I go, eh, if I do that, I'm gonna to have to like form a committee. And then like, there's gonna be all this paperwork. And then I'm probably, there's probably gonna be like a subcommittee of that committee. And then I'm gonna to have to meet with them. And then they're gonna write a report. And then that report, like, and I start like making bureaucracy out of their dream because I am now in this new phase of my life, but they dream it and they go, it's possible. So they keep me envisioning a future, um, a future beyond dams and a future where everybody can drink the water and a future where we feel good about the environment that we live in. And that's, that's why I do the work that I do. So today I'm gonna tell you a story um, about Humboldt County tribes and the Supreme Court. And I like to think of it as telling you this story about the ways in which we have both engaged uh, at a Supreme Court level from our tribes in this local region, um, the sort of starts and stops of that, the movements forward, but also the movements backward that came from that, and what that has led to for us today. Um, and then so you can see that the tribes in this region are very significant to a national and international conversation about tribal peoples, nations, and lands. So that when we think about anything we do in our lives, we should remember that tribes are a part of that. Um, Humboldt County is very different than other counties, uh, which I'm gonna show you here at the beginning in terms of our tribal peoples and the roles that we play. Um, one thing about Humboldt that a lot of people don't know is that many of our tribes are still within their Aboriginal territories. This is very different than tribes throughout the nation who many were removed far away from their Aboriginal territories. Tribes in Humboldt County uh, have never been removed. Some were removed unsuccessfully, if not a strong people, a stubborn people. Uh, and even when we were removed, we just turned around and walked back. Um, but others have been there since what they say is the beginning of time. So I think that it's important to realize we have connections to our land that are beyond time and that we are from this place and we have never been anywhere else and that that connection is somewhat unheard of in other parts of the country. Uh, so we have a lot of really significant historical understanding of this region. 
Um, so I wanted to start today, I have a, a presentation that I'm gonna share with you to give you a lot of information. I always say to people, I always say this to my students, but anybody that I present to, don't try to write down all the bullet points and things because if you really want them, I'll send you a copy of the presentation. Uh, instead, listen to the story and see what you take from it today and then what you remember of it later and then what you remember of it six months from now because those are the things that your brain is trying to tell you you need to know to navigate whatever's happening in that moment and what will stick with you is the thing that you needed to get but if we spend all of our time like writing down words and bullet points then our brain is too busy writing to actually invest in the story so that we can then tell it later in the way that we internalize the message that we need to get. That message will change each time. So if you go watch the lecture again later, you'll be like, this time, this is what I got from it. Well, that's the thing that you needed to take with you. It's a very kind of indigenous way of storytelling and lecturing. We didn't write things down. Uh, and we told the story multiple times over set periods of time. And we kept telling people, what you internalize right now is the thing you need. Later, it'll change. Later, it'll come up again. You might have a dream about it. You might see something in a different place that you're in. Like you might go to a museum and be like, I never, this is the thing that stood out to me because I remember this lecture that happened to me six months ago. And you have to kind of think of it as like a living moment rather than a, I want to take lots of notes um, because that's what we've been trained to do, but it's not the same. So I know it's being recorded. You can watch it again later. I'll send you all the bullet points if for some reason you want bunches of bullet points. Um, but this is just a way to kind of tell a story about the many of the peoples in this region and the things that we've been able to do to kind of invest in and integrate ourselves in and, and really lead in a lot of spaces of when it comes to the law and what happens with Indian people all over the nation. So I'm gonna first share my screen. Let's see. So I wanted to start by setting some context for where we are, just because I don't know where people start in terms of their knowledge about where we are. California is a very large state. Um, and California has a, one of the largest populations of native people in the United States lives in the state of California. So we are a population with a significant population of indigenous peoples. Now, prior to colonization, what they say is that there was close to 1 million people in California. Uh, this is the largest population north of Mexico. As we say to people, uh, we, uh, California was always a very populous place. People always wanted to live here because it was nice. Uh, oh, who doesn't want to live in California, right? It's expensive. We know that because everybody wants to live here. So it's the same thing with California Indians. There was a lot of us and we all wanted to live here. It was really nice to live here. Um, now in 1769, they were able to establish a census number and the number that they established for the number of native people living in California was 310,000. This is the number that you will most likely see or that people use in their scholarship. It's the one that was established by um, the sort of people, the, the people that do the work on looking at all the census records and all the data, they established 310,000. What we do know for a fact is that by 1900, there were less than 20,000 people left. So you're looking at a 90% reduction of the population between 1769 and 1900. This was as a result of numerous policies of genocide that were passed by the state of California at the time in the hopes of eradicating California indigenous peoples. Uh, now by 2010, they do another census and what they have established is there are 720,000 Native American people living in California. So from a population of less than 20,000, at least we have now up to 720,000 people who, are, who identify as Native living in California. They're not all from California Indian tribes, but at least you're seeing how the population grows. It's about 1.7% of the state. Uh, in California, we have 109 federally recognized tribes. This is again, a very significant number of tribes. Uh, there are 577, I think right now, uh, federally recognized tribes in the United States. 109 of them are in California. There's about 80 tribes that are petitioning for recognition. There's over 100 reservations, rancherias, and some allotment lands. If you look at this map, it shows you the California indigenous lands that are spread throughout the state of California. So we are a significant number of population. We have the largest number of population of native people live in California. We have a significant number of tribes at 109 of the 577 tribes that exist 
they exist in California. We have a number of tribes that are unrecognized that are petitioning for recognition. And we have a number of lands that are spread out throughout the state. Now in Humboldt County, uh, Native American people are approximately six to 7% of the population. This is very important because what you see is that while it's 1.7% in the entire state, in Humboldt County, you're talking about six to 7%. So we are a significant population to the Humboldt County region. In Del Norte, it's closer to 11 to 12% of the population is Native American. In some regions of Humboldt County, there are areas that are a majority Native American people. So while you're looking at how we can break down understanding population, we have 1.7% of the state is Native American, but in Humboldt County, it's six to 7%. And in portions of the county, there are areas where the majority of the population is Native American. Same thing with Del Norte County and also Mendocino County. So this is really important to understand in terms of understanding population breakdown and why tribal peoples, tribes, and also uh, the ways in which we interact with the peoples around us are so important to our regions. Uh, you'll look here at this map. This is actually a really great map to, to utilize. You'll see that in Humboldt County, we have some regions that are 25% Native American. Uh, the Hoopa region where the Hoopa Valley Indian Reservation is, is 86.7% Native American. So I think that this is really important to think about land use wise. Now, what we're going to talk about today is federal Indian law and local Indian tribes. Some things to understand specifically about federal Indian law is that uh, federal Indian law establishes the ability of the um, government to regulate Indian tribes. And what it says specifically is that tribes are regulated uh, primarily by the federal government. They are not in any way regulated by states, counties, cities, or other municipalities. So there are some very clear historical reasons uh, based on federal Indian and also just federal law in general as to why tribes are primarily regulated and the regulation of tribes comes between the federal government and tribes, period. Uh, there are foundational legal decisions regarding tribes and how we understand land use and property and um, what happens with tribes when they enter into situations with having to deal with states and counties and cities. And those legal decisions are really made in the Supreme Court. So tribes are always going to the Supreme Court or ending up in the Supreme Court because most of their cases go through the federal side of the law. Now, what's really important about that is that we have a lot of insight into the history of the Supreme Court as we've had to deal with them in a number of different ways through every era of the Supreme Court. I always uh, explain to people, Tribal peoples really do care who's on the Supreme Court, who's making these decisions. When we think about like, what's the importance of who gets to pick the Supreme Court? Uh, the importance is that it will really affect federal Indian law for a number of years, who's on the Supreme Court and how they make decisions. Also that then sets up how we understand what's going to happen in the rest of law, because what they say about tribes, especially if you look at legal decisions that are made at the Supreme Court is we are what's called the minor's canary. Um, they talk a lot about this in federal Indian law, David Getchis, who wrote like a really great textbook on federal Indian law. He says, what you realize when you look at federal Indian law is that we, they are the minor's canary. They are predicting what's going to happen later in law. So when we see a decision made for a tribe regarding a tribal case in the Supreme Court, it always sets a precedent that then becomes a major issue later and people are always saying, oh my gosh, now we ha are having this problem with what happens with environmental protection or what happens with water. And everybody can trace that back to an Indian law case that happened sometimes hundreds of years ago that are bringing up issues that everybody's facing right now. So what Getchi says is they are the miners canary. When you see them making decisions about things with tribes, you should pay really close attention because they are setting up precedent for how they're going to make these decisions in the future. Uh, some very recent Indian law cases that have made national headlines are the McGirt v. Oklahoma case in 2020 and the Herrera v. Wyoming case in 2019. This was actually a really interesting set of cases that just came out because what you saw is that one Supreme Court justice, uh, Neil Gorsuch, actually cited primarily with what they call the liberal side of the court. Um, Gorsuch cited with them saying that he wanted to do closer interpretation of treaty and treaty rights. So he is somebody who has worked pretty closely with tribes and tribal law, who's now on the Supreme Court. In both of these decisions, 
Uh, they were five, four decisions and he sided on the side with what was the liberal Supreme Court justices saying we had to abide by the treaties. And this is something almost unheard of in the Supreme Court. In general, a lot of Supreme Court justices come in without a lengthy history of understanding tribal law. They don't tend to err on the side of treaty rights. Uh, and instead they sort of err on the side of protecting the United States government's interests in land and property. But in this case, Gorsuch tends to err on the side of treaty rights. We don't know what this means in the future. Again, uh, tribes tend to watch the Supreme Court pretty closely uh, because now that was back when Ruth Bader Ginsburg was in the Supreme Court. And so you could see how the split came down. We don't know what'll happen now that we have uh, new people in the Supreme Court like Kavanaugh and how that's gonna split what happens with federal Indian law. Now McGirt v. Oklahoma, very famous case that just came out in 2020. What it basically found was that about half of the land in the state of Oklahoma is within a Native American reservation and that, um, and that what happened was when the state of Oklahoma came into being, it did not usurp or take away the Creek reservation that was basically half of that state. And instead, Oklahoma illegally seized that land. And so now they're saying that land is still native reservation. So half of Oklahoma is still determined to be a native reservation land. So there's still a lot of things coming down about what that means, but that's what they found. Um, and so you see a couple of really interesting decisions happening right now at the Supreme Court level. I will say that one thing that uh, a friend of mine talked about, she actually did an article where she wrote about how she had met um, Supreme Court Justice at the time, Antonin Scalia. Uh, Antonin Scalia was very famous for not ever siding with tribes in federal Indian law decisions. And she actually asked him a question about his background with federal Indian law and like the fact that when you study federal Indian law, it's very frustrating because the Supreme Court consistently makes decisions that just come out of nowhere and don't actually fall in line with any of the law. They just sort of say, nope, we want it to be this way. And he actually told her, we don't get a lot of training in federal Indian law in law school and we kind of don't know what we're doing. We're making it up as we go. Um, so to, when I start telling you about some of the decisions with federal Indian law, a lot of the times what will happen to people is they'll be like, I'm very frustrated. This doesn't make any sense. The best thing I can say to you is federal Indian law makes no sense. It is very frustrating. And what it ultimately comes down to is that it's they want to make decisions that are based on the best interests of the United States government to maintain ownership over land and resources. So when these cases come up where that could challenge that, even if it goes against all legal precedent, or a history of anything having to do with any other cases, they will completely change their mind for no reason at all. And then you'll say, why could you do that? Every other court before you found according to the law and you're just changing your mind. And they're like, cause we feel like it. So I think it's really important to think about federal Indian law that way. It doesn't make any sense. It's very frustrating, but it's important to understand how they keep making these decisions and what that means for us on a local level in terms of our own activism the way we write policy, the way that we engage with our congressional leaders, the way that we think about representation. The cases I'm gonna talk about today are two from two local area, from local area tribes. The first is Ling v. Northwest Indian Cemetery Protective Association, 1988, decided in the Supreme Court. Uh, and then also the US v. Kagama case of 1885. So I have to go over this very quickly in order for people to understand what we're gonna talk about with these two cases. The first is that in case you didn't know, Indian people are primarily governed underneath treaties that they made with the federal government regarding the use of their land and the ability by which to continue their cultural practices, hunting, gathering, fishing, and then the guarantees that were made by the United States government in a government to government agreement of what a partnership would look like so that all parties could live in this space together. Treaties are not selling the land in any way. They are not the United States giving rights to Indian people. What they are is the United States acknowledging that they are making a government to government relationship with native people so that they could negotiate how we were all going to live here together. Uh, I think what's really important to understand is treaties are still used to this day in multiple spaces. We all understand treaties is very important 
to how we manage and, and navigate our own governmental system. But it is also important to note that treaties are supposed to be binding and forever, and they are also supposed to be on par with the Constitution. So where we think of the Constitution as an important foundational document that we always turn to in order to understand our legal system, we're supposed to think of treaties in that way as well. We're supposed to say treaties are on par with the Constitution. We do not currently, most of the time, treat our treaties as on par with the Constitution, but they are there in our own legal system. So tribes having treaties means that they're supposed to have founding documents that are on par with the Constitution and how we interpret what our law looks like. Now, the other place where tribes are governed by documents from the United States is in the Constitution. It's in one particular place, the Commerce Clause of the Constitution, which is Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3. There are only three forms of sovereign entities that are mentioned in the United States Constitution. And this is where we establish what are the sovereign entities that the United States government will make agreements with and what makes something acknowledged as sovereign by our United States government is in the Commerce Clause. So the three forms of um, governments that are mentioned, sovereign entities that are mentioned are states, foreign nations, and Indian tribes. Uh, our founding fathers were very clear to mention Indian tribes as a form of a sovereign government. The Commerce Clause then says that the power of regulating the relationships between these sovereign entities and the United States is only that only happens within these like these four entities, the United States government, states, foreign nations, and Indian tribes. So Indian tribes cannot make agreements with foreign nations, uh, and states cannot make agreements with foreign nations. All that's supposed to go through the United States government. The Commerce Clause also gives power to, of regulating Indians solely to Congress. There's no power for the states to regulate what Indians do. Only Congress can do that. And this was a decision that was made by the Supreme Court in the 1800s that said Congress is the one with what they call plenary power, the ultimate ability to decide on what happens with Indian tribes. States cannot do that. And that's a really important thing that will come up multiple times, that the states, the counties, right, the cities don't have the ability to regulate Indian tribes. It's only the federal government that can do that. Now, I think the three things to understand for the cases we're gonna talk about, first is Aboriginal land claims. This is something that comes out of the Supreme Court cases where Indian peoples are said to have land use rights and occupancy, and only the United States government can settle claims that have to do with Aboriginal land use and territory. You also have that uh, the difference between lands that we need to understand, unceded land, treaty lands, and reservation lands. These are all only regulated by the federal government with Indian tribes. Tribal sovereignty says that tribes are similar to sovereign nations, the authority to govern themselves, that they existed before the United States. So theirs is a more mature sovereignty than the United States. The United States did not give sovereignty to tribal nations. Instead, they recognized them as co-sovereigns in this space. And that that sovereignty and those agreements predated the constitution. So tribal sovereignty actually exists outside of the Constitution. It's not only recognized by the Constitution. And in fact, we demonstrate that through the treaties and the agreements that were made. There were treaties and agreements made uh, with other like foreign governments prior to the creation of the United States. So from the very beginning, you have people recognizing tribes as sovereign governments. Now, the last thing is the federal trust responsibility established by the treaties and the Constitution and all the founding documents that the federal government has a responsibility to protect Indian lands and resources and provide essential services to Indian people. This was what Indian people asked to be written into the treaties because they were saying, look, you guys want free, open access and use of our lands. You can't pay for that. There's not enough money that could ever pay for the amount of land that you want free open access and use of. So instead, what we are setting up is a trust account, a trust responsibility that you will be paying into for all time. It's basically like we're agreeing to this so that we can all live here together, but you have to do this because you can't buy, like how could you ever buy Montana? Like you can't, There's, it's way too expensive. There's not enough money in the world to buy Montana. And yet they're making these agreements about like, this is how we're going to work together. And in the treaties, it's very clear. It says things like, until the end of time, 
until the last sun sets over the ocean. Like it's basically saying, this is a forever agreement that you're making with us. Now we come up to our first case, the Lingvi Northwest Indian Cemetery Protective Association. This is actually a photo uh, from 1988 of, um, if you, you might not recognize him, but maybe many of you know him. Uh, right here, this man right here in the center wearing a no-go t-shirt, that is Julian Lang, a very well-known local uh, Indian person, artist, right, culture bearer, linguist, uh, who is still doing so much work in activism in our community. And here he is in 1988, repping uh, the fight against what became known as the Go Road. This case went all the way to the Supreme Court, was decided in 1988, had a number of things tied to it, I think, that are pretty fascinating but I also wanted to point out was a very local movement uh, that grew and then became represented in the Supreme Court. Now, the thing to understand about the Ling case in particular is that it involved um, the, what, what we in this area call the high country, uh, which is located uh, primarily up in Karuk area, going all the way over into Yurok territory. What we say about the high country is it was a place of great significance to this region it was where many of the tribes, in fact, most of the tribes used this region to train their medicine people, their knowledge holders, and their doctors. So it was incredibly significant to us, this area. And we had used it since the beginning of time. So we tended to it. We, it was a place where we would go to gather. It was a place where we would get many different kinds of resources. It was a place where we would um, camp and live in because we, were, we understood it as a very powerful spot. There's a number of sacred sites in this region, uh, a number of sacred places where people go to train. So it was, it was actually made more significant by the fact that it was shared, it was a shared space of training uh, and sacredness among multiple tribes in this region. So it was identified by tribes as having an incredible sense, like uh, an incredible significance, not just a singular tribe invested, but multiple peoples. Now, um, what happened was the Forest Service is who primarily owns at this point the land that's in this region. There's a very long history as to how the Karuk people were displaced from this area and from being able to sort of utilize and be a part of this area. A lot of that involved the uh, gold rush in um, beginning in 1849, right, with the 49ers. But the, the region that we're talking about was a place of great violence against Karuk people uh, and native people in general. And so you see a big displacement of Karuk people from this area as a result of significant violence. Um, my great grandfather grew up in this region. He actually is from a village very near the, the start of what became the Go Road. Um, and it's, it's called Stewardom. Um, and he actually talked about like what it was like post gold rush because he was born at the very tail end of the gold rush. His mother and his great uncle had lived through the gold rush. He would tell stories about the multiple bullet wounds in his uncle's uh, chest and back, the stories that his mother told him about them showing up to villages, setting them on fire while people were still in their homes, running people uh, off the cliff, right? Like threatening people with death if they didn't leave. Um, and he talked about like this violence was everywhere. And he even talked about how it scarred the land itself. Like he was like, the scars are still there. The scars are on the land itself. If you don't know, during this time, they were doing things like blowing up mountains and sliding them into the river, trying to get at gold that was underneath like the rock. They were pouring mercury into the water it's because what mercury would help to separate gold flakes from the water. So they would pour mercury into streams trying to get at the gold. Uh, they were taking water cannons and using like water cannons to try to build sort of like a way to get into the mountains. So you're seeing a, not just the destruction of the people, but also a destruction of the land. And my great grandfather would talk about the scars that were left on the land and the ways in which like you could see the scars on the land. And he would say, even though they didn't leave the records to tell the story about what they did to us, the scars are still there. And I think that that's important to recognize because the high country was so important to us um, that we recognize that, that the idea that it had made it through this gold rush period, this attempted genocide, that we had to protect it, that we had to make sure we could still utilize it and be a part of it. So we never stopped going into that area, even though they tried to keep us out. 
Now, uh, once the Forest Service got a hold of it, they made a plan in the 80s, sort of late 70s, early 80s, that they wanted to build a road from Gasquet to Orleans. You'll see in the map on the right, Orleans is down here on the bottom right, Gasquet is all the way up here, very near Crescent City, right? And so they wanted to build a direct road route from Orleans to Gasquet because they, they called it a logging road. They were doing a lot of logging in the region. They thought it would create a more straight line and ability to get from Gasquet to Orleans. It would save money for the industry. So they made plans to build this road and they started building it. When they got to the point where they were at about the last six miles of road, um, Indian people like had stepped in. So they were listening to what was happening and they were like, don't do it. There were a number of studies that were put together by the Forest Service where they hired big time archeologists, anthropologists to see what's the effect that this is gonna have on native people in the region? What's the effect this is gonna have on the land? And those reports came back and said, you shouldn't build this road because if you do, it could significantly uh, impede native people from being able to practice their, their culture and spirituality. It could destroy an area of significance and it's not a good idea. So even their own reports came back and were like, don't do it. Even with that, they continued building the road while native people continued to organize, trying to find some way to stop it. Now the organization became very important because what was happening is people weren't really listening to the concerns of native people. So there, uh, there was a lot of like protests and gatherings and the creation of an agency, the Northwest Indian Cemetery Protective Association, who really came and said like, we have to sort of find some way that we can protect this area. It's an area of significance, cultural, uh, social, spiritual significance. And it is our religion. Like without, without this region, how are we supposed to really practice our religion? And they are going to destroy it with a road that's going to be used primarily for logging. And so what you see is, is in this region, especially groups of people gathering together to say, we do not agree with the building of this road. And they created a campaign called No Go for the go road. So you would always say no go, no go on the go road. Uh, people showed up to block the bulldozers that were breaking through the high country. People showed up to sit in front of offices. They went all over the state of California to try to get people to pay attention to the fact that building this road was going to destroy this region. And they kept coming back to, we can't like, this is a freedom of religion issue. This is because you're trying, like you will stop us from being able to practice our religion if you do this. And they kept trying to point to the sacredness of this area, especially to native people. Now, it's important to understand that at the time there was a totally different conversation that was going on about this region and this land that had nothing to do with native people, as many people were sort of le leaning on and looking at it as a wilderness space. In fact, it was really surprising to a number of people that native people kept coming in and going like, no, we use this for many things. They're like, no, this is wilderness. This is a wilderness area. And so there was a lot of conversation around what's the area and what's it for? And what happens when you identify an area as culturally significant or significant to a religion or practice of, um, of like our, our culture and history versus thinking of it as wilderness or like an empty area where it's, a, it's many trees and plants, but no people. So the Wilderness Act, just to understand, national and state parks are created at the end of about the 19th century. This is actually, you have the creation of wilderness areas beginning at the end of the so-called Indian Wars when Indian peoples all over the country are being pushed onto reservations and suddenly you see them being pushed into reservations and then their lands being deemed wilderness so that the federal and state governments can take them and be like, we are creating national state parks and wilderness areas. So if you look at the Forest Service being primarily the big, large owners of this region, it comes under this like, you've been removed, here's this big area, now it's wilderness and now it's ours. So that's what's happening here in this case too. Native lands then get designated as wilderness because it conforms to these notions that somehow these are pristine conditions where nobody interacts with. Yet all of our stories are about how important this area is to interact with. So we were like, it's not wilderness. It's a very significant region to how we are as people too. And this is a fundamental difference in how we view the world. Uh, Indian people often think of wilderness as a very negative concept. If you have wilderness, something's wrong because you don't have people in there. 
helping to make it uh, this, a successful region, a region that is very healthy, right? We do the things, the things that we do are to interact with the ecosystem in a way that actually supports it. And so we're like, if you have a place where there's nothing in there, it's gonna cause massive amounts of problems. So one of the things we know about this for sure is with cultural burning, we burned many of our areas and we, we believed in the interaction of like human beings with the ecosystem, especially through cultural burning. Now what you see is those areas that have been termed wilderness and haven't had people in there doing cultural burning, they're having massive amounts of destruction and forest fires every year. So I think it's pretty significant to think about like how we get pushed out of areas that then are deemed wilderness under the Wilderness Act. Now, this is built upon the idea that native peoples had not interacted with in meaningful ways with significant portions of California. There's a great book called Tending the Wild by Kat Anderson, if you haven't read it. She goes through understanding that there was no wilderness in California. We had named every place in this state already with indigenous names. We had been everywhere. We were interacting with all of the spaces. And she says, generally, when you look at a space and someone says, that's a giant wilderness area, come to find out it's a significant site. It's a sacred site. It's a place of gathering. Like there's all these things that we were doing in that region. So there's a lot of examples of how you understand what happened with declaring spaces wilderness. But one of those is Yosemite National Park where when they created it as a wilderness space for preservation, they actually had to kick native people out of Yosemite who were living there because that's their space, their home space. So they came in and they're like, this is wilderness. And the, and the peoples of Yosemite were like, no, it's not. We live here. We, this is all the stuff we take care of. And they were like, no, get out. It's wilderness now. And we can kick you out under this act. Now, I think what's important to understand is like the, the, the what's associated with it being wilderness, it's this idea that it's untrammeled by man, that visitors do not remain, that it's uh, underdeveloped, right? It's not developed. It has like the, like these are actual quotes from the Wilderness Act, that it has no human habitation, that it's managed to preserve its natural conditions. I think it's important to think about how they use that type of like policy and language to remove Indian people from their areas. And then they use it again to be able to say, you don't get to come back into this area because it's wilderness, right? And we are protecting it from human beings. And native people say, we shouldn't be protecting it from human beings. Human beings should learn how to care for it so that it can be the healthiest version that it needs to be for a healthy ecosystem, which includes human beings. Now, the other thing that was happening historically that leads up to this moment is they were outlawing Indian religions. And so you see like a pattern of them coming in and saying, now native people don't exist in these spaces. We're kicking them out of wilderness areas. Also, we're gonna outlaw their religions. This goes fundamentally against the constitution, right? Uh, amendment number one says freedom of religion. We're not supposed to have laws and policies that outlaw religions in the United States. And yet they were specifically outlawing Indian religions. In 1883, they declared heathen practices to be uh, cited for elimination. 1884, they outlawed pagan ceremonies. And any if an Indian was found guilty of participating in these ceremonies, they were in prison for 30 days. In 1890, they outlawed the ghost dance the religion that was among the Sioux people on the Pine Ridge Reservation and the War Department issued a list of Indians who were to be arrested on site for practicing this religious practice. In 1892, they declared that Indians who openly advocated for Indian beliefs and performed religious dances would be imprisoned. And in 1902, BIA uh, told the reservation agents that they needed to cut Indian males hair, which again is a very spiritual thing for them to have long hair and that if they would not cut their hair, they could starve them uh, to make them cut their hair. And then they said that Indian dances and feasts were to be outlawed. And so they had to enforce outlawing Indian dances and feasts. It wasn't until 1978 that they overturned these policies officially through the Indian Religious Freedom Act, which said, now you cannot outlaw Indian religion. It didn't give any consequences for if you do, it just said we shouldn't do that. So they finally overturned these decisions in 1978. Again, this is when everything starts here in Humboldt County. We've got people saying, oh, now we're finally saying we're not gonna outlaw Indian religions. And now we have this case coming into being specifically about this sacred area and religion. 
Now the case went before the Supreme Court in 1988. Every lower court uh, who had looked at this case found for Indian people. They said that they were not allowed to build the road because it would effectively destroy an Indian religion and religious practice and that that went against the constitution. Every lower court, every lower federal court said that that was their finding. When it got to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court found that the federal government has absolute right over the land, whether or not it interferes with Native American religious freedom. So remember I said, so what happens in federal Indian law? Every lower court was like, nope, you don't get to build the road because you can't destroy a religion under the Freedom of Religion Act. And then the Supreme Court was like, eh, we don't like that. What we're gonna say is we have absolute right to do whatever we want to do with our land, whether or not it destroys a Native American religion or interferes with their religious freedom. The case also showed that Native religious practices were unprotected by the constitution, the free exercise clause of the first amendment, and that laws designed to protect religion in the United States would not protect uh, Native religions. It, it also found pretty significantly that this was the case for all religions. So what it said was, if the federal government is like destroying your religion on accident, it's not that they're directly trying to, it's just that it's a result of what they're doing. Too bad, uh, they can destroy your religion as long as it's not on purpose. It's just sort of a side effect of what they want to do. Now, this was a loss of this case. Uh, in this region, we, it was pretty significant. People were very sad. They were mourning because they had lost this case, which meant that they were going to build this road. However, while the case was on appeal, Congress passed the Smith River National Recreation Area Act, which added this area, the high country, to the Siskiyou Wilderness and officially declared the area wilderness, which protected it from having to build the road. So we couldn't stop it if it was for Indian people and their religion, but we could stop it if we declared it wilderness and took Indian people out of it altogether, then we could protect it. And this is pretty significant. So the act does not speak to or specifically allow native-based management interaction with or continued use of the area. The act does not specifically mention uh, native peoples in it. However, it does mention the acceptable uses of areas, including recreation, public access, off-road vehicles, and program timber harvest. So the only way for us to protect it was to take us out of it and to say that we didn't exist there in that space. However, these two pictures up here are two pictures of me and my friends going up the go road into the high country to do our gathering. So whether or not we were recognized as being a part of that space, we continue to go there and gather and do things and train our doctors no matter what, because it was such a significant area to us. Now, one important thing about it is there were several people who you probably know that were featured in this case. And one of them is Judge Marilyn Miles who was the first, Humboldt County's first woman Superior Court judge uh, who was sworn in in June of 1998. Marilyn Miles was the representing attorney before the Supreme Court for the Northwest Indian Cemetery Protective Association. She recently retired in July of 2020, but at the time she was a new Native American lawyer. She represented Northwest Indian Cemetery Protective Association all the way to the Supreme Court. And one thing that she said in front of the Supreme Court as part of her arguments was we submit your honor that if the First Amendment means anything, it means that the government cannot take away the very ability of an individual to practice his religion at the only place that it can be practiced under the tenets of their religion. If indeed you protect all religions under the constitution, then this type of site specific religion is entitled to protection when it is seriously threatened by government action. So again, a very significant case to the United States, a very significant case to this region. And then you see what happened locally. She uh, becomes Humboldt County's first woman superior court judge. Now, another thing that's important is that the people who have been involved in this case continue to do the work in our community to make sure that we are protecting our knowledges, our sacred sites, and building future generations who can do this work. So we did a project at Humboldt State. Uh, if you go to goroad.omeka.net, it is a database of all of the um, publications and archival materials that we could collect locally from Humboldt State, but also local tribal leaders about the Go Road case about the things that they did, some of their drawings and photos. And Julian Lang, who I pointed out in this first picture, actually came to class 
uh, to the class that I was teaching who were helping to make this archive possible. He taught them about the case. He, showed, he brought his own uh, documents and records. He donated his journals to the project that he, that he wrote at the time. The students got to read them, engage with them, write papers about them and interview several different people who had been involved. So this is an example as to how this has continued in our region, even though at the time it was a loss and even though we had to make compromises, we are still up on the go road doing this work. Now, I think the, the next case, and I'm gonna go through this one very quickly because it's a little bit shorter, is US v. Kagama, which was 1886. It actually involved two men uh, on the Hoopa Valley Indian Reservation. I think what's important for you to understand about this case is that it was in support of what became the Major Crimes Act. And at the time, what was happening in terms of background of understanding this case is that um, they were trying to decide what they were going to do with reservation lands. And you had a number of people in different regions who were deciding how reservation lands were going to be uh, allotted or whether or not they were going to be. And there was a government agent who was working on the Hoopa Valley Indian Reservation who illegally allotted certain lands to certain tribal peoples and made them sort of become private owners, even though it was against federal government policy at the time. And he happened to have these two guys who were living next to each other, who he illegally allotted them land and they were having a property dispute. And within that property dispute, one of them killed the other one. And so this happened on the Hoopa Valley Indian Reservation. It went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the question that they were asking is, does the Major Crimes Act uphold, uh, is it legal? Because if it's legal, what that means is only the federal government can try major crimes that happen on Indian reservations. So this case was the deciding case as to whether or not that, that um, policy that, that Congress had created was going to be legal. And it came from this region between two Indian men who had gotten into a fight over property. Now, something to understand is this primarily has to do with what is happening with indigenous women today in our local areas. Right now, legally, there is no protection for indigenous women in terms of under the law, the way that it exists right now, you can be a non-native person who commits a, a violent crime on Indian land and you have a 50% chance that you will not be prosecuted for it because of the jurisdictional vacuums that they created through things like the Major Crimes Act. So what happens is if you commit a crime against a native person, they may not arrest you and they may not prosecute you because there's all these questions about, is the federal government gonna step in? Is the state government gonna step in? And not only that, what that tends to be is sexual assault cases, domestic violence cases, and cases against indigenous women. So what you see is there's a lot of issues regarding whether or not indigenous women are going to get justice on native lands. So. What's important to understand about this is first, there were several cases that set this up very significantly. First is Wooster v. State of Georgia, which said that tribes should not have their rights infringed upon by states. So it established that states have no rights to infringe upon tribal lands, tribal peoples, tribal laws, only the federal government could do that. Then in 1883, Crow Dog uh, was an Indian man who killed another Indian man and they tried to hang him but, but he sued and went all the way to the Supreme Court and said, you cannot try me because I'm an Indian person on Indian land. And according to Wooster, you have no right to infringe upon what the tribe decides that they want to do in response to me killing another man. And the Supreme Court found you're right. Tribes are the ones who have cr criminal jurisdiction over their lands, and we don't get to decide what that looks like. So if their punishment looks different than ours, if their response looks different than ours, this is their land and they have the rights to do what they want. However, the Supreme Court made this little caveat in what their finding was in which they were like, but ultimately Congress has control over what this policy looks like. So if Congress passes something that takes away the ability of native people to try crimes on their land, then there's nothing we can do about it. So Congress passes in 1885, the Major Crimes Act. And the Major Crimes Act says that federal criminal jurisdiction will go over certain felony crimes, including murder, manslaughter, rape, assault with intent to kill, arson, burglary, and larceny. What they were basically saying is, tribes don't have, they're too primitive 
to be able to do criminal jurisdiction and we don't know how they're gonna handle it and they might be really mean to non-native people or they might not be able to pass laws that we want them to. And we think we should have oversight. So when it regards to major crimes, only the federal government can actually arrest somebody, try them, prosecute them on Indian land. What this means is that when a major crime is committed on Indian land, you have to go to the federal government and say, come and arrest this person, try them and put them to court. And what tends to happen is the federal government will say, no, thank you. We're busy doing big crimes. Why would we come out to this for one person who is getting hurt? And that tends to be Indian women who are being sexually assaulted or murdered or killed by people. They go, it's one Indian woman. There's not a lot we can do. So we're not going to prosecute. And that's where you see this very big vacuum that's created because Indian people cannot legally prosecute for these major crimes. Now the US v. Kagama case comes in just right after. Right after that, it comes in and it asks the question, is the Major Crimes Act legal? Can we keep our uh, jurisdiction uh, as the federal government away from native people? What it found is that um, you have Kagama and his son who killed another man on the Hoopa Valley Indian Reservation, right? And then what it said was, can we enforce the Major Crimes Act? Can we make acts like this uh, under the Commerce Clause? It found that yes, they can hold up the Major Crimes Act, that the Congress has ultimate authority over Indian people, that tribes are domestic dependent, so Congress has the power over them. So this again upheld this vacuum, which has been created to this day in terms of crimes against Native women. Now post that in 1978, there was a case, Oliphant v. Suquamish, in which they found that Indian tribes do not have inherent criminal jurisdiction to try or punish non-Indians, which means that while we can try and punish Indian people within our tribal courts, we do not have jurisdiction to do that for non-Indians. So if you are a non-Indian person who commits a crime on Indian land, you again, based on the statistics, have about a 50% chance that the federal government won't prosecute you and we can't, so you tend to get away from it. And this is something that people are well aware of as a very big problem and issue, especially regarding the issue of missing and murdered indigenous women in the United States. Where we see that one in three Native American women will be raped in their lifetime, it's the highest statistic of any group of people. We're less than 2% of the population. We're the most likely to be sexually assaulted or the subject of domestic violence, 10 times more likely to be murdered than other groups of people. And what you see is this vacuum has created and supported this problem, so much so that people do research where they go like into deep discussions on uh, subreddit boards and things, and they do research and find out that perpetrators pass along this information. They say you should commit crimes on Indian land against Indian people because you have this chance that you will not be prosecuted because these laws don't exist to actually protect people. And then you see that missing and murdered indigenous women is one of the biggest things that has been created in the United States by laws like this. Now, what's important is that it does really come back to and affect our area in particular. There was a report that came out of the Sovereign Bodies Institute just last year, which documented 165 missing and murdered indigenous women and girls cases in California alone, making California the state with the fifth highest number nationally of these cases. Northern California actually outranks many states. It's in so much that if Northern California was a state, we would be in the top 10 of missing and murdered indigenous women in the state. And Humboldt County has the highest number of identified cases in Northern California of any other county. So we in particular have these issues of missing and murdered indigenous women. And it's important to think about how federal Indian law has continuously set up and supported this problem and that they've known about it since 1885 and that they recommitted and supported it in 1886 with the Kagama case, which is why it's particularly important to us in this region that we do this works for people to know about this issue. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna end with this, which is, I think that when we learn about these issues, a lot of the times people ask like, what can I do or where can I go or how can I support this? I think what's important to know is that a lot of the research that's coming out of this region is supporting national change. So in 2010, uh, President Obama passed the Tribal Law and Order Act, which gave tribes the ability to prosecute some major crimes. 
on their land. There's a couple of big test, uh, like pilot test areas that they are doing with different tribes who have been able to do some prosecutions of people who have committed these types of crimes on their land. I think it's important that you support those types of acts, like to say to you, to your Congress people, please make sure you re-up the Tribal Law and Order Act. Every year they re-up the Violence Against Women Act. Within there are provisions to help tribal peoples to be able to prosecute non-native offenders. I think it's up to us to tell our local law enforcement and our local prosecutors that this is an issue that we have in Humboldt County. So how are we going to make sure that we protect our indigenous women in this region? Because it is an issue that is continually growing. Um, and I think that we have to remember that locally, again, we're like the miners canary. So when we see what's happening with our local indigenous women, we have to know this is a national issue and that things are going to keep coming up and we can lead the way in what that looks like rather than thinking about like, oh, that's just part of how it works nationally. We can lead the way in like what it should actually be and what we should support so we change that. Um, so that's sort of my story to tell you today about those two cases. Um, and I thank everyone for sticking with me uh, and I hope that everybody learned something, so. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kutcher Rising Baldi. This is truly a wonderful presentation. And um, I know you're willing to take some questions and um, I'll just remind folks that if they wanna raise their hand to unmike to ask a question, please go do so, or just put it in the chat. And I saw one that's really a good question from Milton. Uh, what is the current status of the protection of Native American religious rights and practices on public lands, especially federal lands? It, it really varies by region and it has a lot to do with the relationship that whatever federal agency is, is in charge of that area has with local area peoples. So let's say Northern California, I can tell you a story about the Go Road. We still go gather up the Go Road all the time. It's still forest service land. It's still designated as wilderness. We go up there and one time when we were up there, we were gathering and we get a little bit freaked out whenever Forest Service people pull up because there's this long history of like people getting like fined and arrested. Um, but I will tell you when the guy came up to talk to us, he said, are you guys here gathering bear grass? Because when it burns one year, the next year we go and gather bear grass because burning actually helps with bear grass. And we were like, yeah. And he goes, well, you know, I was just scoping some up that way. I was thinking how great it was like and how people were really going to like it if you go like if you go about one mile up the road, um, he's like, I saw it today and it's really perfect. And we were like, thank you so much. And then he shared with us how he had received a lot of training uh, in this region about the tribal peoples and the gathering that we do and why it's so important. And so he was, when he sees us, he's like, oh, that's what they're doing. Uh, I think that that's very different. If you look at the Redding area, they arrest people who are gathering on like national lands and they give citations and they stop people. There's a lot of like really awful like relationship moments there. So it, a lot of it depends on who we've been able to kind of build relationships with, which is why I think it's been so important at Humboldt for us to develop things like the tribal forestry concentration or miners and indigenous natural resources management because you get students who are taking these courses and then getting jobs in the federal agencies and then asking different questions. Uh, I think that's changing because we have Native American studies. So it really depends, but I think it's getting better in multiple regions. I would also challenge people to constantly be asking the question, like how are we supporting indigenous peoples to interact with this area with whatever policy or things are coming up? I see another question. How will current law regarding crimes committed in, uh, on native uh, land affect the pending trial of the young man killed the three people? On, I'm not familiar. Oh, the, the Bear River one? Um, well, it's, see, California is a really interesting state because on top of everything else, they passed this law in the 1950s called Public Law 280. What Public Law 280 is, is it agreed that there would be certain states that they named who would have what they call co-jurisdiction with tribal nations within those states. And one of those states is California. 
So what that means is we have an automatic co-jurisdiction with the local sheriff's offices, not the cities, the cities, it's, it's all the county areas, uh, which means that um, if our tribal police are, they can be co-designated as deputies within the sheriff's office, therefore they can arrest and prosecute people who are who are through that because they're, they're co-deputized basically. Uh, and that can happen in the state of California. However, that also depends on relationship. So you can sometimes get a, a sheriff who's really into that kind of co-jurisdiction and relationship, and then you build really great partnerships and then people can sort of arrest and move in different directions. And sometimes it, it's not a good relationship with a sheriff. And that's another reason why I think we have to ask the questions of our candidates what do you know about tribal jurisdiction? How do you approach tribes? How do you work with tribes? Because especially in this region, you are very likely gonna come across issues with tribal nations on their lands. Um, and so what usually happens is that the person will be arrested or like by the county or by the county government. It doesn't really affect what happens because it becomes county jurisdiction at that point. And the tribes will generally be like, yes, it's county jurisdiction. Uh, however, there are some tribes who are trying to what they call retrocede from Public Law 280, which would then make it a federal government issue. Benefits is that you can actually have people from the federal government come in to prosecute. The not benefits are, again, you're involving this larger agency that might not address the issue in the same way. So a lot of it is like navigating the complexity of that. Thank you. I think Jane has a question about... Um... Do you think that the new interior secretary is going to be a force to improve policies towards Native Americans? I think so. Um, we call her <laughs> we call her Auntie Deb, uh, but yes, I think I think Deb Holland is going to do as much as she can. My my thing I like to point out to people is she's only one person, one voice in a very large system. As somebody who has been introduced to a very large system and is sometimes the only voice in the room, it it can be very difficult. Uh, it can be very difficult to get people to understand what you're trying to say. It can be very difficult to get policy passed. Um, but I do think that what she does do as a representative person is she opens up conversations when she just walks into a space that maybe they weren't willing to have before. And I think she really listens to Native people. And we are a creative bunch. Like we've been navigating this for over 500 years. We have figured out a number of things about what this could look like. Um, and I think you're seeing a change amongst people in that they really want to support Native peoples rather than just try to sort of get rid of them. So I think she's at a good time. Uh, I don't expect, I don't expect like miracles from her about how you're supposed to navigate bureaucracy in a federal government system because the whole system is in and of itself, it exists. But I do think that she's going to do things that, that matter to us in the long term. Uh, and we think very long term when we're thinking about federal Indian policy, it's not just what's going to help us in the next five years, it's what's going to help us 150 years from now. It's like, what are we going to do for the next generation in the kind of policy that we write? Um, I see a question about the legislation that's pending. So there is a lot of legislation that's pending. And I think one place to get a lot of that information is actually through the Sovereign Bodies Institute. Um, and that, what's really cool about the Sovereign Bodies Institute is they're very focused on like how we can start to talk about the legislation that we need to pass. I would highly recommend following them on Facebook, following them on like all these different spaces. What they talk about is the legislation that's being, that's being introduced statewide. So there's a lot of like different states that are introducing legislation. Then there's federal government legislation that's being introduced. Um, there was a really important act that was uh, put pushed through and as a result of a lot of um, outreach and lobbying was able to be passed. Again, not in the same way I think that we would have wanted to, but we'll see. Uh, it's called Savannah's Act. I think it's really important that if Savannah's Act ever comes up for renewal that people support that. I think it's set for people to sort of talk about how they're going to enact Savannah's Act. It was passed in like 2019, I think. Um, and it's based off a young mother who was kidnapped. She was kidnapped and murdered because her baby was stolen from her because uh, she was pregnant at the time. Um, and they talked about like what happened law enforcement wise that didn't allow them to be able to intervene soon enough to be able to get that case off the ground. So they're looking at how do we approach what that means for law enforcement. Um, I do think that Deb Holland has actually tried, she's pushing for a inquiry on missing and murdered indigenous women in the United States. 
and like a working committee, she'll need support for that too, to be able to implement the like working committee on missing and murdered indigenous women. I think we've been kind of pushing for our own state government to look into doing a missing and murdered indigenous women inquiry, uh, especially because we're seeing California as such a site of missing and murdered indigenous women. I have not heard of anybody like, I know that James Ramos, who is uh, one of the, the first California Indian legislature in the legislature right now, um, James Ramos, he's from Southern California, has talked about introducing legislation to sort of set together a missing and murdered indigenous women's task force in California. Uh, it would be good to look into his office and to support, he has like everything up on his website about how to support the things he's trying to pass, especially to help with things like that, like an inquiry into what, what is really going on here and then how do we address these issues. Um, and Cyril had asked me to talk about the Food Sovereignty Lab. Uh, I will say that on top of everything else, our students are raising money right now for the Food Sovereignty Lab and cultural workshop space at Humboldt State University. Um, there's a short video if you just if you wanted to watch it at some point on YouTube. It is a project of our students who designed what they hope will be a space for leading research on food sovereignty in, um, in this region and support tribal peoples in doing that work. We have a steering committee that's made up of people from the different tribes in the regions who do food sovereignty work. Uh, we've been able to, we had to raise $250,000 to remodel the space that we have on campus so that it can become a lab for food sovereignty. We have so far raised $210,000 um, in just one year. So we only have $40,000 to go. I always tell people like, that's, that's it. And then we can say, we're gonna be uh, opening this space. I will tell you, there's going to be a groundbreaking. They just sent me the save the date for the groundbreaking in October. So no matter what, we get to start uh, groundbreaking um, for this uh, lab. And it was going to be on uh, October 8th. Um, so October 8th, we're going to start the process of remodeling a space on campus to become the Food Sovereignty Lab and Cultural Workshop space. It's going to be a beautiful envisionment of what students had put together. It's been as like a project primarily that came out of students doing work in one of my classes. We envisioned the space. We interviewed people in this region about how we could make it a possibility. We talked to elders and practitioners and staff and faculty about what they wanted to see on this campus. And from there, the students have written and done all the fundraising and they help me write grants and they do everything. It's going to be amazing. And, and I can't believe that it was like a group of 25 students who are going to make this happen. And it's grown so much in how many people are supporting it. We have over 200 supporters at this point. So I highly encourage you if you want to look at the video and things, it's all been the vision of students. And part of that they'll tell you in the video was me telling them, let's dream something together in this class and then see if we can make it happen. And they just started saying, what if we did this? What if we did this? And then the space came open on campus. I was like, let's apply for it. And then we got it and I was like, let's raise some money. And everything has been just because of their, their joy and their like excitement for what they could do. So I highly recommend, it's a beautiful project and I can't wait till it comes into being because we're gonna do so much fun stuff around indigenous foods and food sovereignty for this community. And I think for everyone to kind of help them. So I'm excited about that. Yes, I think Jane has a question. Yeah, I wondered if you have a working relationship with uh, Congressman Huffman to discuss some of these issues and introduce legislation at the federal level that might deal and clarify some of these issues because there are limitations of what can be done at the state level. Yeah, I have, I mean, I don't have like a, I don't have very much of a working relationship with him. He's sometimes in the same spaces as me. And then I come in and do the talk and then I peace out, right? And then I don't know what they talk about after I leave. Um, but I will say that I, I'm always open. I mean, I think he does a great job of like going in and listening to communities about what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, I think what we're creating right now in Humboldt County is the data and the reports and the things that people need so that they can go into those spaces and be like, nope, we already did that work for you. You now need to do something because we've been able to gather the information. Uh, and I think that that's something that's coming out of Humboldt County that a lot of people are, um, they're modeling like their efforts after of like, what do we need to do now so we can move this forward? We have a lot of peoples with a long history of working in this region. So when you're talking about what's gonna happen with fish or what's gonna happen with like uh, 
traditional ecological knowledge. What's going to happen with the water? Like we have people in this region who are native that have been doing that for 50 plus years. Look at like what's been going on with Julian, right? Like he's been involved in this uh, ever since he was very, like very, very young, like 19, like 60s, right? So I feel like we're the next generation that's going to take up <clears throat> what they've been doing and we're turning it into what are the supporting documents that we need so we can take this to the next level to make things happen? Um, and there's also a commission that's happening right now with Gavin Newsom, the Truth and Reconciliation, I think, or Truth and Healing Commission. Um, so Gavin Newsom is actually the first governor of California, I think, to specifically call what happened to Native people in the 1850s genocide, and then to apologize, to actually issue an apology about genocide in this state. And then he put together what was the Truth and Recon Truth and Healing Commission. Uh, it's a way of Native people to come together with the state to say, well, what do we do? What does that look like? What are the policies? What are the programs? Um, and I think that that's a really important thing to know and support as well, because there is movement in his office to move that forward. And so I think, I don't know how involved Huffman has been in that process too, but I do know that I feel like Huffman listens a lot to tribal peoples. He comes up and he hears about what they're doing and he's been very involved in that way, so. You've used the, um, your class to create one new project, um, the sovereignty, the Food Sovereignty Act. Um, perhaps you could use your class to propose legislation uh, that could be passed at the state and federal levels that would be, give it momentum, give it a solid basis for what needs to be done. Um, that would be a very creative way to get them actively engaged, not only with the law at the state and federal level, the federal law in particular, and the Indian law. Um, but, I mean, it's a great medium for teaching kids. Yeah, I think we've been thinking about that more and more. They did write, um, I have them learn about testifying, like doing public testimonies, and they mm -hmm. have to write their own public testimonies regarding certain legislation that's being introduced, then they go and they practice them uh, so that they can get more comfortable with doing that. And I think that that helped because when the issue with Terragen came up with the Wiat peoples, um, many of the students who had practiced public testimony showed up and did public testimony at that board of supervisors meeting. Uh, and I think part of it was sort of preparing them for like how you get involved at the level of where the policy is being made. So I think that that could be really fun. I mean, yeah. and I think students have some of the good, the best ideas. Um, so I love, I love that idea. Did you teach, do you actively teach them advocacy? Uh, all, yes, all the time. I think advocacy, being able to speak on uh, like for what they've been learning. We do a lot of preparation around like, I have them write letters. So they do, they learn about writing letters to different like peoples in different policy making areas. We actually go watch different things all the time so that they can see how it works. And then learning about how to use the talents that they have. So for instance, most of the things that have been created about around the Food Sovereignty Lab, where they're advocating for what we want it to be, were made by students. Any of the videos, any of the flyers, like all of it is them, is me saying like, how can we make this so that we appeal to the community? And then they make them and they edit them and they put them together. So we rely on their, their own talents. What, where do they identify of what they want to do? Those who want to write more, they've written the reports. If you look up the Food Sovereignty Lab and you see the first uh, Food Sovereignty Lab report that was written by our student, our student research assistant. Um, so they are getting very good at, I mean, they showed up to the, sen the, to the faculty senate meeting and testified. Like it's been a really, I think amazing experience to see how they can organize, like organize and use their voices to build really powerful things for our community. The other thing you could consider is inviting them to engage in putting together um, articles for Echo News. I'm sure they'd love to do that. They just did an article in the food guide, the Humboldt food guide. They wrote an article about the food sovereignty lab. So if you pick up the Humboldt food guide with right in there is a, is a article written by the students about the food sovereignty lab and the plans for it and what it'll look like. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Kutcha. I, I was just looking at the chat, thanks to Amelia. And she uh, mentioned that Robert had a question about what are your thoughts on the Trinidad Rancheria hotel project? I don't know if you can speak to that. Um, not, I mean, not really. Uh, I, I, cause like I haven't done as much reading into it as I think I should, but also 
Um, I have a public affiliation with the Trinidad Ranchery. I like have worked with them on several different things. And so, and also with all kinds of tribes in the region, I, I leave it up to the tribes to make their statements about things. Um, I will say that I think everything that we do has a push pull, right? And we have to make decisions about things based on what we know is best for our peoples. I trust in tribal decision processes because I've been on the side of being a tribal person making those decisions. We don't, we don't do anything lightly, especially now uh, we think about things very significantly. And I don't like to be like me, me myself, when I do work with tribes, like I never come into the space, like I know better because I have a degree or like I, they have a historical connection and understanding of things that I'm coming into. Um, I like to listen more than I like to sort of say, this is where I think things should go. Uh, and I would encourage everybody to do that, to like really listen to where people are coming from. And then to think of us all as participating in like community. So when you build community with people, you are going to disagree sometimes about how things are supposed to happen. How do you build the community like relationship enough that you don't just walk out of the room like I'm done having this conversation, but instead figure out how you learn to work together. Uh, and if you look into the history of the Trinidad Rancheria specifically, I think what you'll find is a really great knowledge of the, all the work and activism and things that they had to do uh, to be able to remain in that region and that what had happened to them historically, I think does really inform what that means for how they understand the region today. So I would highly encourage people to learn a lot about Rancheria specifically, like the displacement of native peoples, the Landless and Homeless Indians Act, get all that information and then start thinking about it in total in terms of your understanding of projects or things that are happening at the time. So are there any other questions from anyone? If not, I want to thank you all and most particularly Dr. Bobby. That was a wonderful presentation. We hope to bring you back soon for further presentations because they're truly informative and give us insight that we don't have otherwise. <laughs> we ought to all sign up to take your classes is what it sounds like. So thank you ever so much.